Good morning and welcome to First Lutheran Church where we gather to worship together as God's people. We come together to pray, to sing, to hear God's word, to confess our sins, and to eat a meal together on occasion. We are glad that you are joining us and hope that your life will be blessed by the time that you spend worshiping with us. If you would like myself, Pastor Naomi, or Pastor Jim to come to your home, to your apartment, to your room, please give the church office a call and we'll be more than happy to come and visit you. Thank you for being with us today and God's blessings. Good morning and welcome to worship. It is good to have all of you here as we gather today to begin our Lenten journey on Sundays. And so um, Pate, I would like to draw your attention to our schedule. Um, we will continue obviously worshiping on the weekends as we have been. On Wednesdays we will gather at 10 o'clock in the chapel and at 6.30 in the chapel as well. And we'll see how we go from there. Also in between 10 and 6.30 at 5.30 we have our Lenten suppers um, downstairs. This week is the ever favorite lasagna, so do come. Um, we're kind of known for our lasagna dinner, so do come and be part of the fellowship that happens there. Also this morning, um, after this service and after the 1015 service, up in room 302, I, the art series continues. This week, I believe we are decorating crosses, and the crosses were made uh, for this by the Bee Gees, and there's a wide variety, and. Uh, Peg and Lori have put together all kinds of things that you can decorate or embellish your cross with, so please um, come and take part in that as well. Are you going to do your cross today? Um, and also, Pastor Jim will have his class um, in between services in the chapel, and so um, if you are interested in that, please take part in that as well. I think those are our announcements for today. We are going to be doing a couple of new things this morning. First of all, you will notice that we have a Lenten confession that's called Teach Us the Wisdom of God. There is a um, spoken part, and then a, right across um, in your bulletin, it says Teach Us the Wisdom of God is a little sung part. The choir is going to sing part of it. We'll join in, we'll do the confession, and then we'll sing again. So follow Jan's in my lead. on our sins and the meaning of repentance. Repentance is our response to God's boundless grace. We look for clear direction and firm guidance from God. Repentance is turning from darkness and walking in the light. We strive to become people who are more loving and less self-serving. Repentance is taking responsibility for our actions. We seek forgiveness and place our faith in God's mercy. Repentance is trusting God's eternal grace and his steadfast love. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, both in our deeds and in our inaction. We have forgotten your teaching and have loved ourselves more than our neighbor. 
Through your Holy Spirit, come and work repentance into our hearts. Open us to change and growth. Give to us an experience of grace that lifts our burdens from us and enables us to live rich, joyful lives for the good of others and for your kingdom. <coughs> Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, Oh That the Lord Would Guide My Ways. I invite you to sit as we continue with our spoken Kyrie, which is printed in our bulletins. We pray, Lord God, for your church throughout the world. We pray that we and all Christians We pray for those who suffer for faith and conviction. We pray for our country. We pray for the life of the world. We pray for those who are ill. Finally, we pray that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ may be known and accepted by increasing numbers of people. Our response is hymn number 782, My Shepherd, You Supply My Need. This is a new hymn for us, so David, why don't you play it through all the way, and then we will join in and we will sing it together. It is the words to the 23rd Psalm.
Lord God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide us now so that following your son, we may walk safely through the wilderness of this world toward the life you alone can give. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Our first reading this morning is from the 26th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning with the first verse. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our, our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit down to you, O Lord, the fruits that you have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Our psalm for this first Sunday in Lent comes from Psalm 91, and let us read that responsively. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. You will tread upon the lion, cub, and viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. They will call me, and I will answer. I will be, I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. Our second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 10, beginning with verse 8. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So ends our readings. Our gospel lesson for this first Sunday in Lent comes from the fourth chapter of St. Luke. Will you please stand as you're able? This story follows immediately after the story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him all in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give this in all their glory and all this authority. 
for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put your Lord the God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until the opportune time. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We take fasting very seriously around here. I learned that Wednesday after the Ash Wednesday service. I overheard a conversation between two men back in the narthex about giving up things for Lent. And they were talking about Dove chocolate bars. So butting in, I said, so you're giving up chocolate for Lent? He said, oh no, I'm just giving up Dove chocolate for Lent. <laughs> Baby steps, I guess. <laughs> in Roman Catholicism, fasting is part of the necessary preparation for receiving Holy Communion. Even modern Catholics are supposed to fast for one hour before receiving communion, or going swimming, I suppose that applies too. In this day and age, most Lutherans, at least us ELCA Lutherans, we probably don't think about too much about what we have to do to prepare ourselves for communion, other than maybe uh, saying a prayer uh, while others are up before us. But Luther in his small catechism says, Fasting and bodily preparation are good, are indeed a fine outward training for the Lord's Supper. But he is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. For us Lutherans, fasting is okay, it's just not required. In our gospel lesson for this first Sunday in Lent, Jesus goes on a fast. He's just been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And in his baptism, as you will remember, uh, the Holy Spirit descends upon him in bodily form like a dove. Well, that same Holy Spirit, Spirit immediately then leads him into the wilderness where he begins his fast. He is led, not forced by the Spirit. He goes willingly to undergo this testing. Jesus stayed in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights being tested. And that's meant to remind us of the 40 years that the Israelite wandered in the wilderness where they were starving much of the time. And during those 40 days, he's tempted by the devil. The devil here is not a green-scaled guy with a pitchfork and pointy tail like the one in the window over there. The word devil simply means tester. His, his job was testing God's creation to make sure that it measures up to God's standing. They measure the, uh, test the creation and its creatures. He was God's quality control guy. Adam and Eve were tested in the same way in the Garden of Eden. And that is a test that they failed. You know, wilderness retreats were then and still are common spiritual practices which are used in Many different religions, uh, people in Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, we all fast at very different, various and different times. Going off by yourself in fasting and prayer are intended to clear the mind of the, all those cluttering day-by-day uh, -day thoughts that uh, take our attention. And the deprivation is intended to induce a hypnotic trance-like state in which God can speak, kind of the purpose of, of fasting. In this case, Jesus was being spiritually tested to prepare himself for the ordeal that he knew was coming, an ordeal that we're going to hear about over the next six weeks, leading to his suffering and execution on the cross. At the end of his 40 days of fasting and testing, the devil throws three more tests at him, we look at it kind of as the final exam. 
in each of these three tests, the devil invites Jesus to perform some action that would be attractive to most human beings. In each case, Jesus rejects the devil's offer. So I, le I label this the don't do this column. And then in each case, he offers a course of action which God demands. I label this the do this column. So when we read this story, therefore, we are be being given a final exam for the godly life, complete with the answer key. So let's look at the first test. The devil tells Jesus, you're hungry. There's a rock there. Turn it into bread. You've got the power. Do it. Anyone who has ever fasted, either as a spiritual practice or as a part of a diet, knows what it's like to have that little devil perched on your shoulder, whispering to your, in your ear, go ahead, eat one more Dove bar. It's easy. Nobody's going to know. It's pretty easy to cave. And what makes it so hard to deny ourselves food is that food is a physical need. Our bodies, through our nervous systems and our brain, keep telling us to eat, eat. Turn those stones to bread. What would it hurt? Just have something to eat. Jesus quotes scripture in response. One does not live by bread alone. This temptation and Jesus quote do not simply refer to food. The devil appeals to Jesus' primal needs and tells him to rely on material things. Jesus' response is to rely on the spiritual as well. Don't rely, don't rely on material things. Do store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Material things will always, always let you down. Usually in a pretty short period of time. If Jesus had turned that stone into a loaf of bread and gobbled it down in just a few short minutes, he would have felt guilty and hungry again. Instead of having a stomach aching with hunger, it would just ache with, by being over full. There's a lot of research been done recently about the value of obtaining material things as opposed to experiences and how they make us happy. When we purchase something material, a computer, an iPhone, a car, or even a new house, we receive a burst of satisfaction and happiness. Yes, things do make us happier, sometimes a lot happier. But it doesn't last for very long, not for very long at all. Very soon, the new computer crashes just like the old one. The new iPhone comes with a hefty service plan that you're going to have to pay. The car gets its first scratch and covered with winter road salt. You can't tell it from your old reliable clunker. And the new house eats up your day off, demanding more and more maintenance. With any material acquisition, our happiness spikes quickly, then drops off just as quickly, and we're right back where we started. That's not true with experiences. Take, for example, going on a trip. You've probably all experienced this. I know that 30 pilgrims who are going to the Holy Land with me this spring are already getting excited. They're reading books and figuring out what to bring with them. They're trying to picture in their minds what the garden, garden tomb will look like and what it will be like to stand on the same mountain where Moses stood and looked out over the promised land. And maybe even the best part will occur after they come home. They'll read the Bible with new eyes. They'll bump, each other, bump into each other at church and laugh about some of the experiences they had. Unlike material things, which quickly lose their value, experiences get better and better with age. They will continue to bring happiness long after the event. So it is with spiritual experiences. The time we spend in prayer and meditation and worship on Sunday morning or in our own home, homes will grow and continue to bless us as we go forth from this place. Realizing that there is more to life than accumulating stuff that bring, is, brings true happiness and long-lasting satisfaction, do not store up treasures on earth. Do store up treasures in heaven. 
Well, unable to trip Jesus up with an offer of material things, the devil gives him another exam. He takes him up on a high mountain where he can look out over all of the powerful nations. Today, you can take a cable car up to that spot and have dinner on a restaurant when you look out over there. And you can see Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan, as well as Israel. And the devil says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, you can be the king over all of this. He's offered the chance to be a man of great prestige and authority. Jesus would also be encouraged to seek power by his followers. They wanted him to be the Messiah, a great king, a powerful king on the earth. That, as we know, would not be. Instead of becoming a powerful king, Jesus humbled himself to the earthly authorities. The devil says, worship me and seize power. Jesus quotes scripture and says, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus' power came through love and humility. The quest for power is an insidious force in all of our lives that might go unrecognized. Now, none of us are Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton seeking national office. Only a few of us are CEOs and upper-level managers with hundreds under our supervision. But we can be tempted to exert authority over other people in our lives as well. The first place that comes to mind is in the family. If one person, father or mother, exerts undue and oppressive authority at home, the atmosphere can become toxic and abusive. Instead, parents need to act out of humility as well as power in order to model for their children what balanced relationships look like. When, ba when relationships uh, let their ba power get out of balance, it turns very quickly into an abusive or uh, dysfunctional family. The same is true in the workplace. All of us at one time or another have had an overly authoritative boss who can make your life miserable. It's my way or the highway is their mantra. Jesus has a better way of dealing with power. To his disciples he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Don't flaunt your power in the world. Do live with a servant mentality. Well, the last test that the devil puts before Jesus is to test God. He transports him up to a high tower on the temple and says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He who will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus could have been the first base jumper, I guess. Those guys who jump off buildings and cliffs wearing bat suits. And this is where the Bible verse, the old saying comes from. Even the devil can quote scripture. Many times in his life, Jesus is asked to prove who he is by performing a miracle. Even when he performs a miracle, he does, not, he does it out of compassion and not attempt to prove something. There were lots of miracles workers around in Jesus' day. He could have been just one more. But Jesus says, don't tempt God, do trust God. This temptation says something about the nature of faith. Faith is about having a trusting relationship with God and about loyalty to God. In our lives, we start with the assumption that God is good and just even when things aren't going our way. We don't call upon our friends to prove their love. We assume their love. Think about what we sing in Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. 
And then we repeat three times, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. He doesn't have to prove it. Thomas Beckett in T.S. Eliot's play, is Murder in the Cathedral, is tempted to draw upon God's power to demonstrate his righteousness. And he comes up with the following conclusion. Now is my way clear. Now is the meaning plain. Temptation shall not come in this kind again. The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed, but for the wrong reason. Jesus passed the test. Can we? The devil is always lurking. Even at the end of the story, it says, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Just before Easter, we're going to hear about that time, what the opportune time was. The devil will enter Judas and convince him to betray Jesus. So during this Lenten season, remember, don't give in to the devil. Do follow Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as it's printed in our bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hearing the call to return to the Lord, let us join the whole people of God in prayer for all who cry out in pain and in hope. Break down and mend divisions within your church. Bring together rich and poor, homeless and housed, and those who hold differing political views into the one body of Christ. 
unite us in our worship of you. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain citrus groves and orchards, provide rich soil and water in due season to our abundant harvest, and then help us to share the fruit of your harvest with all people. Lord, in your mercy. Raise up peacemakers in nations and communities ravaged by war and violence. Pour out your spirit of wisdom on their leaders. Help them to respond with your mercy and justice. Make peace flourish in all the world and in every community. Lord, in your mercy. Protect all who feel, flee oppression. Grant refuge on their journey. Provide shelter where it is needed. And give healing to those in need of your healing hand. Today we especially remember Violet, Sherry, Sarah, Ron, Jamie, Sandy, Millie, Karen, Ruby, Edith, and Diane. Lord, in your mercy, teach us to love you. Open us to encounter our enemies as neighbors. Give courage to trust in your redeeming love and to proclaim your gospel to all people. Lord, in your mercy. To you, gracious God, we commend all for whom and for what we pray. Those prayers that we speak with our lips, those that are written on our hearts, those we can utter only a sighs, and all the things that you see that we need. We trust in your boundless mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. We now prepare our hearts and our minds for the gift of the meal. And the night before he died, our Lord and Savior took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and you are all welcome here, for the gifts of God are free. You may be seated.
I invite you to stand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, give you strength and peace today and into your life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms the making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now until we meet again, receive this benediction. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. Amen. Today we are lifting up and celebrating the Boy Scouts in our midst. They are serving the coffee this morning. So say thank you to them for what they do and who they are. Go in peace to love and serve our God.